Okay, so Aaron talked about the evil of self-sacrifice. The title of my talk is The Virtue of Selfishness. And obviously I'm borrowing my title from the title of a book by Ayn Rand. Um, uh, she has a collection of essays on ethics or morality called The Virtue of Selfishness. Now, right away, if you think about the way we understand the idea of selfishness in our culture, this should strike you as very strange. Why would somebody write a book on morality and call it the virtue of selfishness, right? Everyone in our culture today knows, it's, it's taken for granted, it's obvious that selfishness is a vice. It's not a virtue, right? Um, so why would you write a book called The Virtue of Selfishness? So if you, think about, if you think about the way we understand selfishness in our culture today, like what kinds of things come to mind? If you think about a selfish person, what kind of person do you think of? Just call it out. What kind of people do you think of when you think about a selfish person? Okay, well, I, not specific individuals, but just in general, like what kinds of characteristics do you, uh, what kind of characteristics do you think of, do you associate with selfishness? Criminals, okay, liars, psychos, okay, but even, uh, even on, a, on a more um, less extreme level, you know, just, just the, the people who are sort of thoughtless, right, people who don't, who just have no regard for other people. Right? These are the kinds of people that we associate with the idea of selfishness, right? It's, you know, like it's the guy at the party who takes four slices of pizza before anybody else has even had one, right? That's, that's the, the kind of thoughtless person we think of as a selfish person in our culture today, right? Or it's the guy on the freeway, you know, who's driving too fast, cutting people off, trying to get ahead, you know, um, putting everybody at risk just so we can get ahead a little bit faster, right? Or, you know, people mention criminals. I mean, the, 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 the uh, worst examples of this are people who prey on other people. They steal, you know, they talk, people talk about liars, cheaters. I mean, people who commit murder, right? You think of somebody like Al Capone, right? This is the mafia boss in Chicago in the 1920s who had a whole organized crime ring that was all about preying on other people in order to get what he wanted, right? Um, so this is the way we understand the idea of selfishness in our culture today, right? It's, it's these kinds of people. Now, um, Aaron did the show of hands thing, so who, who's read the, you know, read either the Fountainhead or Atlas Shrugged. Um, so for those of you who've read those novels, um, you see, if you look at, if you think about a character like Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead or Dagny Taggart in Atlas Shrugged, right? These are people who are being portrayed as paragons of selfishness in these novels, right? They're, they're portrayed as egoistic individuals in the stories. But do they have anything in common with, you know, Pizza Guy or, or Al Capone? I mean, when you think about Howard Rourke or Dagny Taggart, is this the kind of person that comes to mind? Obviously not at all if you've read, if you've read these works, right? So um, what we're seeing here is that Ayn Rand has a radically different conception of what selfishness even means. Um, that the, she's taking a look at, at the conventional way that we understand the concept of selfishness and saying this is fundamentally mistaken. So, and she's, she's sort of rethinking the idea of selfishness from the ground up. Um, so, um, what is it that's mistaken about the conventional way that we understand the concept of selfishness in our culture? Well, if you look in a dictionary, you know, what do you, what do you, if you look up selfishness in the dictionary, what do you see? This is a pretty typical, you know, I think this is a pretty typical kind of definition, right? It's, it's a, a concern for one's own welfare or advantage at the expense of or in disregard of others. Right? I mean, if, you, if you, you've, you've looked this up in the dictionary, this is a pretty typical kind of thing that you would see. Notice that there are, so what, what Ayn Rand um, draws attention to with this kind of understanding of the idea of selfishness is, notice that there are two elements here to this definition, right? Selfishness means 
concern for your own interests, right, without regard for or at the expense of others. So there's these two different parts to the definition, both of which are perceived as being essential to the definition. So the idea here is built into the very way that we think about selfishness is the idea that in order to be concerned with your own interests, you have to have no regard for other people or, or be acting at the expense of other people, right? That what it means to be concerned about your own interests is to have no regard for or act at the expense of other people. So it's sort of like this is what it means to be self-interested is to, so the, these two parts automatically go together, they necessarily go together, that to be self-interested, to be concerned with your own interests means to prey on other people, to have no regard for other people, to be thoughtless, to be cruel, all these characteristics, right? And the idea is um, that what this implies is that in order for you to get ahead, you know, you have to suffer, right? That in order for you to win, you have to lose. It, it, it's the idea that um, selfishness necessarily means that there's no such thing as a win-win relationship between people, that there's only win-lose relationships, right? For you to be concerned with your self-interest means that you've got to prey on or, you know, act at the expense of other people, right? But if you think about it, I mean, I think in, in our experiences, in our lives, we know that this is simply not true. It's just, it's simply not true that there's no such thing as a win-win relationship. We experience those all the time. You know, if we, if we go to work, you know, you, you're presumably the company you work for benefits from the work that you do. That's why they hired you. And you benefit because you get paid. You know, presumably you like the work that you do. That's a win-win relationship, right? When you spend time with your friends, you know, presumably you like hanging out with them. That's why they're your friends. So you benefit from being with them and they benefit from being with you. Where's the you know, exploitation of other people? Where's the disregard of other people in that, right? It's not there, it's a win-win relationship. Even something as simple as buying groceries, you know, you get the groceries that you need and the store gets the money that you pay for them. You know, again, where's the acting at the expense of other people or in disregard of other people? So, um, so, this conventional way that we think about the concept of selfishness, there's something that's fundamentally mistaken about it, okay? Um, it's simply not true that to be concerned with your own interests necessarily means that you have to act without regard for other people or at the expense of other people. It's just, it's, it's completely mistaken to think of it that way. And so, but, and yet, and yet, as we saw at the beginning, I mean, this is the way we think about selfishness. These are the kinds of people that we associate with the idea of selfishness. So the, the concept, the very concept that we have to think about what is in our self-interest or not in our self-interest is fundamentally mistaken and is, and is problematic. So this is what Ayn Rand is identifying. Ankar mentioned in his talk that She's radical even at the level of thinking about how we use concepts and the, the way we use concepts to understand the world. So Ayn Rand had a, had a name for the kinds of mistake that people are making when they um, use a concept like selfishness. And she called it a package deal. So the idea is, um, well, I mean, the, the term comes from the idea of you know, like if you, if you book an all-inclusive vacation, right, you get the flight and the hotel and the food, and it all comes together in one package. That's what a package deal is. Now, you know, an all-inclusive vacation is a good kind of package deal, but um, what Ayn Rand, um, in her writings and her philosophy, identified a whole, a whole bunch of conceptual package deals that are problematic. And they're problematic because what they do is they take two very different ideas that don't belong together and they treat them as though it's a single unit of thought. So this is what we're seeing with the idea of selfishness, the idea that to be concerned with your self-interest necessarily goes along with the idea of having no regard for others or acting at the expense of other people. 
So that's a package deal. It's taking these very different ideas and grouping them together as one thing. Um, and so she was always on the lookout for these kinds of errors in our thinking and concepts that, you know, distort our thinking in this way. Um, so one of the things that she tries to do is to break up this package deal. She wants us to reconceptualize the very idea of what it means to be selfish. It's simply not true from her perspective that to be concerned with your self-interest requires that you have no regard for other people or that you act at the expense of other people. She says that's a, that's a conceptual error. It's a package deal. And we've got to cut it out of our thought and re reconceptualize selfishness from the ground up. Okay, so if being concerned with your own self-interest does not require preying on other people, what does it require? You know, what, 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 is, what does it mean to be concerned with your own self-interest? So let's take a step back here. Let's have a pause on the slides for a second. Um, what she wants us... Oh, you can, you can leave it up there. I wanted the blank slide. Um, so she, no. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll get to plants and animals in about two seconds here. So she wants us to rethink morality from the ground up, okay? Selfishness is a moral concept, right? It's a, it's a concept that pertains to what's good and what's bad, you know, how we should think about how we live our lives. Um, so where does the whole realm of morality come from? Right? If, if we want to rethink morality from the ground up, we've got to ask, what gives rise to the need for morality in the first place? So the way Ayn Rand um, begins this thought process, she says, you know, what is the basic fact of reality that gives rise to morality? And it's the fact that living organisms face the alternative of life and death. Okay, if you're, if you're plants or animals, if they don't get the values that they need to survive, they'll die. And it's this basic alternative that gives rise to the very need for morality. Now, or it gives rise to the very need for values. So, so living organisms pursue values, and, and you know, um, they need those values in order to survive and flourish. Now, for plants and animals, you know, they're shaped by evolution in order to do this sort of thing automatically. There's, so there's my plant. So you know, a plant is going to grow its roots down into the soil, to get water and nutrients. It's gonna put up its leaves to get carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so it can do photosynthesis and, and that sort of thing, right? Animals you know, are, are shaped by evolution to have all kinds of behaviors that they pursue in order to you know, get food and water, to keep themselves safe from predators, et cetera, right? Now, um, human beings though, we don't, automatically get all the values that we need to survive, right? Um, we, we're, what, uh, as a result of our evolution, what do we have that plants and animals don't have that, that um, makes a difference in terms of how we go about pursuing our values? What do we, what do we have, what, is, what did evolution give us that it didn't give the lower animals or plants? Thumbs, Aaron says thumbs, free will. I mean, basically, it, it gave us this big brain, right? The, the basic way that human beings have to pursue, the, 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 the basic means that we have to pursue the values that we need to survive is by thinking, by using our minds, right? Um, we don't automatically know how to find fresh water, right? How to, uh, how to hunt down animals, you know, in order to be able to eat them, how to build shelters, right? We have to figure all these things out. We don't have built-in behaviors that allow us to do these things automatically. And if that's true at the level of sort of a primitive hunter-gatherer kind of existence, you know, just think about how much more true that is in, in our complex industrial division of labor society, right? Again, coming back to the novels, if you think about Dagny Taggart, um, so she's, she's the operating vice president of a transcontinental railroad. Just think about all of the 
questions that she has to answer on a daily basis to keep this whole system running, the problems that she has to solve, right? She's got, you know, thousands of employees operating hundreds of trains, serving thousands of customers, shipping freight all across the country in order to provide this value of transportation, right? Um, you know, so just think about all of the hard thinking that she has to do in order to make this happen, all of the decisions that she has to make. Um, now, again, this doesn't happen automatically. And the other thing is that um, there's, it, it, it's really hard work. It takes a lot of effort. And we face all kinds of resistance and temptations not to want to put in that effort. Also in Atlas Shrugged, we, we, you know, Dagny is contrasted with another character who you might be familiar with if you've read the book, her brother James Taggart, who's the president of the railroad. And he's the perfect example of somebody who absolutely does everything he can to avoid doing the hard thinking and the hard work required to uh, you know, achieve this value of transportation. He, he doesn't want to face reality. He doesn't want to face the facts. The very first words out of his mouth in the book are, don't bother me, don't bother me, don't bother me, right? Um, so what we see here is that uh, the hard work that Dagny does in order to solve all these problems, answer these questions, the hard thinking that she has to do, it's not automatic, and it's actually a real achievement. She has to choose to commit you know, her energy and her effort to doing that work. It's, it, does, it doesn't just happen. Um, and there's all kinds of examples in the world of people who don't want to do that and who choose not to do that. So it's really important to understand the fact that it's a choice. Um, or think about, we also talked about Howard Rourke in The Fountainhead, right? Think about the kind of thinking that he has to do in order to you know, design a beautiful structure that serves the function that it's, that it's uh, intended for. So he's got to think about all the things that he has to integrate, the site, the materials, you know, the, the, the um, purpose and the function of the building, the specifications. He's got to take all of this. And now for Howard Rourke, what he wants to do is, is design a building you know, to, to that, that is an expression of his creative genius that, that is, you know, doesn't just follow the traditions of the past. So he's got to do all this work to conceive of the design, you know, and then there's all the work that goes into coordinating all the labor to construct the building in order to get the finished product, right? Now, um, he's contrasted in, in the Fountainhead with people who um, don't want to exercise the independence to come up with their own, create, their own creativity and their own designs. The, the, the whole rest of the profession that he's fighting against in the novel are people who just want to copy the designs of the past, right? And who want to follow architectural authorities. So this is another temptation that, that we can fall into um, of, you know, exercising reason to a point, but not doing it in a way that's independent. So, uh, yeah. So the upshot of all of this is um, the basic means of human survival is reason. But reason doesn't function automatically, and we face all kinds of temptations and, and there's all kinds of opportunities to resist having to put in the hard work that reason demands. So the implication of all of this is that in order to act in your own self-interest, what it truly means to be selfish is to be committed to as a is to be committed to practicing the virtue of rationality. That's the, that's the essential, fundamental principle of the objectivist ethics, really, is, is that um, what it truly means to be selfish is to, is to use reason as a matter of conscious, deliberate commitment, 100% of the time, 
you know, treat it as an absolute and as a matter of principle. Um, okay, so being concerned with your self-interest does not mean going around preying on other people. It means living a life of reason and choosing to do that as an as a act of principle. Now, what that looks like, so she cashes this out into a whole set of other virtues, some of which you sort of hinted at here, right? Um, and Ankar talked about some of these, Aaron talked about some of these. So, you know, what it means to live a life of rationality is to, you know, to choose to be committed to rationality is to choose to be, to, to, be, to, to exercise the virtue of independence, integrity, justice, honesty, pride. Ankar talked about pride, productiveness, right? Um, now, Ayn Rand has a lot to say about um, each of these virtues and, and what it means to embrace these as virtues and to commit to, you know, practicing these virtues as a matter of principle. And if you dig further into her writings and into the objectivist literature, there's a lot that you can learn about um, how to properly pursue your own self-interest by practicing these virtues. Um, but I wanted to put this list of virtues up here just to come back to the beginning of my talk. And again, to think about when you think about these kinds of qualities, you know, if a person exhibits these kinds of characteristics, you know, is this the kind of person that you think of, you know, that you would associate with pizza guy or Al Capone, right? Um, this, and I, I think what this highlights and underscores is just how radical Ayn Rand's reconceptualization of morality is. So this idea that we have in our culture of what selfishness means, it's, you know, Ankar likes to use the phrase 100% wrong. And so I think that's, that's applicable here too. It's 100% wrong. We have to rethink it from the ground up. And I wanted to bring in this point about package deals because the, the concepts that we use, um, concepts are our tools of thought, right? We use concepts in order to think about our lives, think about the world, make decisions, and act in the world. And if our concepts are completely mistaken and broken, that's going to impede our ability to think clearly about what we want out of life and how to act and how to make the choices that we need to make in our lives. If you and so you can think about it this way, if you're trying to build a piece of furniture and all you have are a bunch of broken tools, you're not gonna get very far, right? It's gonna hamper your ability to build the furniture you're trying to build. So what Ayn Rand points out with regard to concepts is that if our concepts are broken, think about how hard it is to build a life if the conceptual tools that you have are broken. So this is why it's so critical to get our concepts right. And in particular, you know, the concept of selfishness is such a fundamental concept uh, in terms of thinking about you know, what we want out of life. It's really important to get that concept right and to be clear on what it means. Okay, so let me just wrap up and summarize my takeaways here. So the first point is it's not true that selfishness requires you know, acting at the expense of other people or preying on other people, these things that we think of in, in, in our conventional understanding of the, of the concept. Our conventional understanding is a package deal that distorts our ability to think clearly about morality. And what true selfishness requires is a commitment to rationality and all these other demanding virtues. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so I think we have microphones over here, and we have uh, 27 minutes? No, 17 minutes. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I, so I have a question about uh, the virtue of productivity. So obviously okay. in objectivism, there is um, a unique emphasis on productivity, perhaps compared to 
other philosophies and history as I understand it. Uh, and I'm wondering, is there a, um, in the sort of periods of, in history with extreme, very productive periods, so the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the um, Persian period in the Dark Ages, et cetera, was there, is there any sort of emphasis on productivity that sits upstream of that in philosophy or how else could we think about the, the reasons why those were such productive periods um, without that kind of grounding? Yeah, um, it's not the virtue of productivity. So that's one of the things I, I want to, but I, I, the only reason I say that, not to be quibbly, but when, I th when people think productivity, they think like, how many widgets did I make this year? Did I up? That's related to productiveness, but it's not the same thing. Um, but productiveness is a, is a moral virtue in the sense that what you're doing is you're producing the material values that your life requires. More and more and more of them to make your life better and better and better. And objectivism thinks of that as a moral virtue because she thinks of morality in terms of life and what life requires and flourishing requires. And that's center stage uh, for her in terms of morality. Um, people did think well of things like hard work, maybe to put it in even a little better terms that John Locke would put it in, industriousness. And that there's something, about, there's something valuable about that. Um, but sometimes the motivation for that is good, sometimes it's not so good. It's hard work because man must suffer, right? And, and God expects us to, to toil and, you know, you know, till the earth or whatever, and it, it shows your commitment to the suffering of life. But industriousness is more like what you're putting into it, there's an output and there's a product and there's something valuable about it. Um, but even then, I, I don't know, that he, I don't think that Locke would put that as a, uh, I think he ha has a morally tinged positive perspective on that, but I don't think he would list that as a virtue, but I, I could be wrong about that. I, I would also say, I don't, think, uh, I don't think you need, you know, a fully conscious, worked out understanding of the virtue of productiveness in order to underwrite productive activities, right? I think, I think uh, it's, all, it's almost the other way around. It's people, um, you know, you, you look at periods of history where humans have flourished and periods where they didn't, and you recognize the one difference is is, is people are acting in accordance with this virtue. So. I think we should go, yeah. we're going to alternate yeah. sides here. Yeah. So. Yes. <laughs> so with the recent and ongoing war in Ukraine, a lot of people, including myself, have been feeling a need to uh, figure out how to help a lot of people who suddenly undeservedly find themselves in need. How would you go about, and I guess this is a question mostly to your talk, Aaron, how would you go about thinking about that, maybe distinguishing a kind of valid solidarity from self-sacrifice? Well, I think the first thing to think about is, I mean, sometimes people think about, yeah, you can help others so long as it's not a sacrifice. I think that's too weak. Um, I think you should think about it more, that's too permissive, put it that way. I would think about it more as, what are you after? What positive value are you trying to achieve that you know is, it, you think of as, this is advancing my life. This is honoring something that's really important to my life. And I think of this as, this is advancing my life. Um, I would think about, what is that? Is there something like that? And if there is, that doesn't tell you, uh, you might, you might, if you're able to, do something in that regard. But then again, is what to do? Um, is it, uh, it, it may be enough in terms of your own sort of abilities or resources or whatever you have to show some kind of solidarity and to speak out or to say something about what is unjust about this. And, and just so there's another voice out there um, who's calling out this as, as the injustice that it is. Uh, and is that a, do you send money to aid? I mean, that, those, are con those are concrete. Those are specific things. And it's like, how much money do you have? What other things could you be doing? Is that, is that the right response to this? I mean, there's suffering everywhere. There's injustices everywhere. So you have to think about, like, what should my response be to that? And I think there is a, there's a, there is a morality behind thinking about this is an injustice and, I don't know, my integrity or whatever, it deserves some kind of a response. But what kind of response? And, and A, non-sacrificial, and B, something that advances, uh, you think of as this is advancing my, my goals or my life or my values, or protecting them in some sort of way. Um, but in some ways that could just be, you know, demonstrating a real solidarity or speaking out or 
uh, something like that. It, it doesn't always mean you, you send money or something, or you put on a flak jacket and go down there. Uh, so I don't have any sp concrete specific things to do, but yeah. So my question is about the relationship between focus and the virtues. So there are two sets of moral terminology that Ayn Rand gives us. That is uh, focus, drift, and evasion, and on the other side, the virtues like rationality and independence. So are these two aspects of the same thing? Is a moral person, a person who is focused, or does it, is it determined by, uh, is a moral person a person who is independent and honest? How do you determine who is moral? And then if you, are, you can be focused and dependent, deceitful, uh, or irrational, like what is the, it's about the relationship between uh, these two sets of moral terminologies that I want to get more clear about. Well, I mean, um, well, let me start by saying that tomorrow morning, Ankar is going to give a talk about free will, where he's going to go into exactly uh, what Ayn Rand's theory of free will is. So stay tuned for that. But um, I mean, I, I, there, I don't think there are different sets of moral concepts. Um, reason operates by certain means, and it has certain characteristics. And one of the characteristics of our rational faculty is the fact that it's volitional and that it, it's something you have to choose to exercise. And so I think, you know, it, it, if you, they're, they're just, they're different perspectives on the same phenomena. So if you look at somebody who characteristically chooses, you know, to, to focus their mind, to think, you know, to do the hard work that thinking requires, that's the, per that's the kind of person that we say is practicing the virtue of rationality. And, um, yeah, so I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really think of them as different moral concepts. They're just different perspectives on the same phenomena. Do you Thank want to you. add to that? No. Does that answer your question, what you were getting at? Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. Good. As, as businesses and companies become ever more altruistic in their propaganda, how do you determine at what point you're sanctioning that altruism when you selfishly purchase their products? Uh, it, that's complicated. Um, and I don't know that I have exactly a satisfying answer to that. that, that, that here's the answer. Um, but I think that if you, you, ha you have companies who have a sort of a general, I guess we should say a few things about you know, how we're kind of green. <laughs> we don't use paper towels in the bathroom or you know, whatever. And they have some kind of, they don't really know how to manage that, those kinds of pressures to be more green or to give back or something like that. And so they kind of, they kind of cave in a bit and they do a little of that and they kind of gesture toward, I guess we're sort of moral a little bit. And it, it's not a good thing. Um, but. I, I wouldn't boycott any you know, company that does that. It's sort of widespread. They're not philosophers. They're not self-confident. They don't know how to think about these kind of things. And it's, it's not super surprising. Um, and it's not like a deep sin or something. It's another thing when you have someone going full on uh, on these things and they make it a fundamental aspect of what they're doing. And you have to think is, am I, am I advancing and rewarding this kind of thing? Um, and uh, I mean, yeah, it, or is, is, the, is, is how they're presenting their company, their hiring practices, their marketing, how they project themselves, the values that are built into that. If like, these are all bad, they're really bad, and they go full on into it. It's not like they just start to stumble in it because they don't know how to think about how to deal with this sort of stuff. There's a real question then about like, why am I rewarding this kind of thing? And it's all, it's some of these kind of little things just even if you don't, it doesn't have a big impact on their bottom line or something because you sort of step back. But it's like just for cleanliness. I mean, sometimes it, I think some of that's worth doing. Uh, okay. Uh, if Iron Man ideas were spread around the world, uh, it's truly transform it. But do you think personally, if nowadays with nowadays world, uh, it will be a self-interest choice? 
to promote and try to convince people about objectivism despite of cases where commonly cases where they are not able for grasping or even they are not interested and you feel that they don't really uh, deserve deserve those those ideas or even that sustaining such ideas may create you prejudice with your relatives okay is is go ahead. well uh, there's a there's a, a bunch of different elements to your question. So, you know, do you, in what capacity, in what form are you going around spreading Ayn Rand's ideas? If you're talking about arguing with relatives who aren't open to hearing about them, like you have to make judgments about how much success you can have and how open people are to to the arguments. Sometimes it's not worth it, you know, if people are just completely closed uh, to do that. Um, I mean, another way that I could interpret your question is sort of. Is it in our self-interest for everybody to, who's, who, who embraces this philosophy to decide, okay, well, I have to somehow be an activist and I have to make this my career? No, I mean, then you have, you have to decide what kind of work you enjoy doing. And if you, if you like intellectual work, you like giving talks, you like writing and teaching and that sort of thing, you know, maybe that's a path for you. But, but you don't have a duty to go spreading a philosophy because you think the world needs it. That would be, you know, kind of self-sacrificial if it's not your career passion. Uh, so those are some of the things that I would say about that. Do you yeah, yeah, it's not that? your duty to save soul. You know, if you want to put it that way, it's not your moral duty, your objectivist duty, so to speak, to, to save souls. Um, I mean, your, your obligation, if you want to put it in terms of obligation, is to your own life and happiness. And thinking, that's hard enough. Um, and there's also, is if you think that what you want to do is you want to talk to people, you want to convince them, uh, people, you want to give people a better perspective on this thing, it's a lot of work to then go figure out, like, how, do I understand the philosophy? How well do I understand this? Do I, am I, do I have the ability to communicate it well um, and, 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 to, and to be effective about it? And it, that's, that's a lot of work by itself. Uh, but I, I, get the, I get the desire to share it, partly because of the values that we get out of it. Uh, but it's not, it's not an obligation, but it can very much well be in your interest to do so. But it's... It's hard enough to, to live, and it's hard enough to, uh, to, understand, to understand the philosophy. Thank you. Hello. This is a question for Kimmy. Uh, but you, you talked about the classical definition of selfishness and how it combines uh, both concerns for your own interests and expectation of people. And you're saying, finding how it's completely unessential. The expectation of art, in fact, is so completely unessential that if you want to, to improve your life, then exploiting people is really not the way. And then you say you replace that definition with concern to your own interest plus reason. And my thought is, are you not package dealing again? Are you not adding a non-essential <laughs> to selfishness there? Couldn't selfishness just be concern for your own interest? And then you can be rational or irrational in regards to that goal. So for example, you could have a criminal who is interested in that. They want to be a richer without working. They want to not do a desk job, whatever. And they, in a way, they believe that their own self, their interest is just Know, to become a criminal and do some really stupid things. But at the end of the day, obviously they're, they're irrational, but they're, they're still being selfish in that regard. And so rationality is something, a bonus. So you would say selfishness, like rational selfishness should be the way rather than just selfishness. You sound like you wanted to... Yeah, sure, I'll, I'll jump in on this. I, I mean, I, I, it doesn't matter who... Uh, no, I, I think I understand the question. Um, no, I don't think what Ayn Rand is saying is that um, you need to redefine the term selfishness to be an objectivist. I think that, that's packaging too much of a particular philosophic theory into the general definition. Her view is selfishness just means, in, when she means a dictionary definition, I don't think it means that she had this 1952, page 17. It was more of like, it's, it's a non-evaluative conception of what it is. And you're not building in, you know, it's selfishness and you're a bastard. It's no, it's just, no, what is selfishness? And it means, it means concerned with one's own interests. And that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a non-evaluative, morally neutral statement of what selfishness is. And I think she thinks that is what selfishness is. So you do have Pizza Guy, and you do have Al Capone, and you have different conceptions of what people think of as in their interests. And, it, you know, if they say, here's my interest, like uh, Thrasymachus from Plato's Republic, if you've ever read that. It's like, well, it's might makes right. It's, it's I, get, I get you before you get me, and that's what's in my interest because people are horrible and whatever. And so... People can have different conceptions of what they think of as concern with one's own interest. This is why Ayn Rand qualifies what she, uh, 
qualifies that kind of the word glitchy. It's rational self-interest. And the, the book, for The Virtue of Selfishness, the subtitle is, which we all forget, is A New Conception of Egoism. So she's presenting a new conception of what it means to be in your self-interest, and that's what she calls rational selfishness or rational self-interest. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think we would, I don't think it would exactly be package dealing to build in, like, reason exactly, but it's more, I think, if, if, the, if what you're getting at is, are we just building in something that maybe shouldn't be in the definition? I don't think that's what I, Ayn Rand would advocate doing it. Yeah, and we have one minute and two more questions oh. there. So can you both ask your question and then you decide how you sure. approach what them? You want, where you want it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. So this one's kind of leading on from that question a bit. But uh, we heard earlier today in the first talk about how a lot of people are trying to rebrand uh, definitions of stuff in today's society like racism and trying to make it mean a new thing. So how would we avoid like hypo hypocrisy in a way when we're trying to re redefine uh, the concept of uh, selfishness? Okay, so I think Nikos wanted us to hear the questions and then yeah. answer them. So David. let's hear this one as well. Okay, shouldn't we sometimes sacrifice for other people? Because if we do, they will be there for us when we need it. Okay, I'll yeah. do this one and you do that one. Yeah, so, sure. At the same time, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, the, so the, the Ayn Rand's point about concepts is that they're tools for grasping reality. And so the question in evaluating any concept is, does it represent an accurate um, understanding of the way things actually are in reality? So it's not just, well, we have our rebranding and they have their rebranding and aren't we being hypocritical and they're being hypocritical. No, it's the question is, what are the facts of reality that give rise to the need for this concept? And is the concept and the definition of the concept accurately capturing what's going on in the world? So that's, that's what I would say to that. Okay. And you, David. No, so the, your, your, your question was, uh, isn't it sometimes rational to sacrifice for others because then they might be there to, for, for you to help you out? If you have reason to believe that that's actually what's going on, why, is it, why, do you, why would you characterize that as a sacrifice? So if I, if I, if I help somebody with the expectation uh, of gain, and, that, and I wouldn't put that as a sacrifice. Sacrifice is your, your, your surrendering something that's more important to you for the sake of something less important or non-important. It's a net loss. It's a net personal loss. I don't think it's ever rational. I, I don't know why I said I think. It's never rational uh, to engage in that kind of behavior. But if you're doing it for the sake of, like, if I help this guy out and I help her out and then people think, geez, he's helpful and they might help me out, I'm doing it for a gain. I'm doing it for an expected gain. And so you expect to profit from it in some sort of way, even if you don't know whether that will bear fruit in the future. So I wouldn't characterize that as a sacrifice. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. Okay. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss a video.